Hey everybody, this is uh, Right Side Vegan News here uh, with Winnipeg Alternative Media uh, with our weekly broadcast. Uh, and we're going to have quite the show for you today. We got a great uh, guest today who's going to be sharing some great knowledge with us uh, about uh, a lot of um, interest that I've had. And uh, so, yeah, we have, um, we're going to have uh, any links we show today will be in the Discord. And if anybody's looking to donate, you can always hit the donate button on our website. And um, yeah, so we're going to have uh, Diamond and on our show. And his name's David uh, Murillo. And so I'm just going to give a little uh, intro. So Lee and Diamond have been working hard on the Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer Ranch project for three years now. They have had successes and failures as they learn from living in the high desert wilderness. They are two humans who no longer support the inhumane oligarchy empire model destroying our planet and our true nature as human beings. As activists, they decided to do something about it. So they opted out of their former lives and began anew. They are currently transforming a pristine alpine wilderness into a self-sustaining homestead and organic farm in preparation for the upcoming collapse. David, otherwise known as Diamond, grew up in sub Southampton, just outside of Philadelphia. He attempted uh, temp yeah, he attended Temple University where he received a bachelor in science in geol uh, geology and stayed on to teach his master's degree. Diamond's recent work is a social and environmental justice initiatives, including urban vacant lot farming, GMO awareness, and other green endeavors, finding even greater expressions in the Oppenheimer Ranch project. He has extensive background in landscaping, residential and commercial construction. He also is a master dry set mason, skills which fit nicely with his tax, tasks on hand. Earthship anyone? So this is Diamond. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having, uh, you know, coming on the show and taking the time today for us. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's awesome to have you on. Do uh, uh, you have any other thing you want to say about uh, your current life of, uh, on that intro that I missed? Well, let, uh, I just really wanted to reiterate the fact that uh, – Activism can take many forms. And around a decade ago, the spiritual awakening, and, and this involved me changing my whole life in a different direction. And that was to either help others in, in some way or to teach others uh, what I had uh, found out, so to speak. Now, my work in academia uh, for decades and all of the work I did in uh, construction and stuff, uh, you know, got me jaded and I was really buying into the mainstream narrative until this spiritual awakening happened in 2010. And then the Occupy movement shortly followed in 2011. And after I got involved in that, I, my eyes were open to banks and, uh, you know, the Illuminati or, or whatever you want to call it. But, but moreover, a, a huge conspiracy that we are all living worldwide. And, I dedicated my life then to a, a certain form of activism that most people are aware of. And that's, you know, organizing people, marching and protest type activism. And, and what I realized from doing that is that that only has a very limited scope. Unless you're handing out flyers and actually teaching classes to the masses, most people don't understand what's happening during these marches. The people in the marches are well aware but to actually impart change, you have to become it. And, and that was a big awakening I have. Uh, I helped organize the March Against Monsanto in 2012. Through 2013, I uh, was the organizer in Philadelphia for that worldwide event. And through that, I realized that there's enough rhetoric out there. Everyone is telling us that there's this, that, and the other. But who's actually doing it? So I met this wonderful woman, my partner, Leah, and we sat down six years ago and, and, and made a think tank. And we started discussing all the problems in the world and, and what we could do to impart change. And that's when we decided to come out here to uh, actually do the activism that we wanted to see. And, and, and 
Therefore, we're being the change we want to see. And I think that being the change you want to see is the only true form of activism. Growing your own food, opting out of the corporatocracy, creating your own local uh, monetary system through bartering. These are all things that we have to re-embrace in the future. And so that's the, that's really what I wanted to add. And that was a great intro. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think those are very important points too. Uh, especially with, with your journey you've, uh, gone on, it's given you quite the experience. Um, yeah. So I guess, uh, just, you know, going into it, you know, I've, I've really been watching a lot of stuff you've, uh, been talking about, about the grand solar minimum and, you know, the magnetic reversal and how our, our growing seasons are shifting. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's something that's noticeable. And if, especially if you're watching for it and it's, and especially with, you know, what's in our food system, growing your own food and being able to survive on your own means is so important. So like, uh, going into the magnetic reversal, um, you know, uh, yeah, what's going on with it? Like, how, how, wh why is it happening? Like, what's, um, yeah, give us a little bit of uh, what's going on with it. Well, it, the, the topic of magnetic excursion is yes. really not one in the mainstream. Uh, so when, when like people in the media pick up the term magnetic reversal, they just put it in the Google box and, and they get up the limited scientific information that is magnetic. Reverse. Now, the last actual polar reversal, which is on the Google or in Wikipedia, a mag the last magnetic reversal was over seven hundred thousand years ago. Who it? And that and that is an actual polar reversal. Were different. They they are actually flipped. So we're talking about something that's a, a lesser degree, but not necessarily less bad. And these are called magnetic excursions. And, and scientifically, uh, we have dis, uh, deciphered uh, the magnetic geologic record over the last, let's say, 100,000 years. And we have determined that these magnetic excursions, they're not full reversals. But what happens is the poles, they migrate away from the top of the, of the rotational pole and they head towards the equator and then very bad things happen and then pop back. And, and this time of excursion can last a few hundred to a thousand years, but afterwards they pop back and everything's back to normal. But during that short time period, all this hits the fan, so to speak. And, and this is because as the excursion is occurring, the, and the reason it's occurring, many believe, is that the the mag the magnetic field, the magnetosphere, which protects protects our Earth from cosmic rays and other dangerous radiations from space, which is why we're all here, which is why there's biological life on Earth, that wanes, and it, and it, and it can go down as much as ninety five percent. And at that minimum point, let me tell you, if the sun came up and you went outside it would be a very bad day because it would be like walking into a near a nuclear reactor or into an x-ray machine. Your hair would fall out. Your teeth would fall out. You, you'd die a horrible cancerous death. So th this is what we have happening over the last hundred thousand years. And, and these events are episodic and periodic. They seem to be happening about every 12,500 years. And it just so happens the last one was 12,500 years ago. And right now we're living the modern magnetic excursion. So, so that's magnetic excursions or reversals in a nutshell. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's very well said. So you had gave me a, a chart here. Do uh, you just want me to put that chart up and you can kind of explain it? Sure. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, so what you're hopefully looking at is the known magnetic excursions. Now, if you ask any mainstream scientists in any field except the multidisciplinary field of, uh, let's say, a certain type of geologist that studies magnetic field, no one will know that this is the facts. In fact, this list of known excursions has been compiled over the last decade from the independent researchers that have been studying uh, 
something that's fringe, what we call cosmic catastrophe. It's the field of, um, well, it's not a uh, general, it's, we were all ta taught uniformitarianism at university level. And this is where all events happen gradually and slowly. In fact, catastrophic geology had all but been swept under the rug on purpose by the powers that be because they didn't want any scientists or people in the general public to know about these events. And when you look at this chart, you know why that that's the case because the powers that be have some sort of inside information that this event is happening now. And you could see clearly from the chart here that there is a 12,500 or, or so periodicity on the event. Now we know we're, we've been entering one since 1800. Around 1810, the North Pole started to move uh, east across the northern uh, plateau, and it just passed the North Pole. It's headed towards Siberia right now. And it's been accelerating every 50 years, and recently in the last decade has accelerated the same as the last 50 years. So what we have is the magnetic poles of the planet rapidly moving. The South Pole has now left the uh, continent of Antarctica and is headed to the west coast of Australia and eventually Indonesia. And the North Pole should make its way down from Siberia to the same spot. And <clears throat> from the information that we now know, it, it, this complete excursion, meaning the poles could literally reach the poles within 35 years. Now, that's not the bad thing. The bad thing is when the magnetosphere wanes to a point where the shields are so low that the effects on Earth are unimaginable. And, and what I mean by that is <clears throat> our magnetosphere has been waning for hundreds of years, and we are now entering another solar cycle. These are 11-year standard sun, sunspot cycles that happen on our sun. And the sun is ramping up to start shooting off solar flares. With, with the magnetosphere weakened as it is and continuing to weaken, solar flares are putting a huge risk on our grid. And you guys up in Canada know that all too well because of the 1989 event in Quebec that shut down the grid for half a day. Now, that, that minor perturbation pales in comparison to what's coming. And if it's not coming this year or next year, it's certainly coming by 2023. There will be an X or a, an X flare that comes off the sun, earth facing, that will fry major portions of the grid on the earth. It won't shut the entire earth off. It's going to start slowly and there will be portions of the earth that go dark and, and they just won't go dark for nine hours like Quebec did in 89. If they fry the main grid, uh, there are, I mean, we're talking one to three years to get those grids back up in certain regions. So if you're talking a major metropolitan area, you're literally kicking back millions of people into the Stone Age that have no way to deal with that situation. And there will be no infrastructure, no communications to help out the situation. So literally Mad Max in a minute. Yeah, and that, that goes uh, goes along with a lot of what I've been um, starting to share with my uh, followers and listeners about the magnetos magnetosphere waning and and um, and how we should be paying attention for the CMEs and what's actually happening, and and like the and our, and their effects on our on our health and our um, mental health and our weather is is something that happens too, right? Um, can you explain a little bit about why it affects the mental health of uh, people and uh, the weather? Well, you know, this is all speculation. There are hundreds sure. of peer-reviewed papers on, on geomagnetic activity and human health. They know there's a direct correlation uh, twofold. So the one direction is uh, what we call KP0. And this is when the shields are way down. The sun hasn't flared in a while. It's completely silent. This is the grand solar minimum effect we talk about. The last three solar cycles or 30 years, the sun has been getting lower and lower and lower in activity. And right now, if you, if you check out the telemetry on any space weather site, you're going to see that the planetary K index is at zero right now. And this is the same as the full moon effect, the werewolf effect. And there's even uh, Freedom of Information Acts 
that have been uh, <coughs> demanded a decade ago that haven't been even published until three years ago. And this, this was published by Mudrock where the CIA had been doing studies in the 50s and 60s on geomagnetic activity and telepathy. And what they found was that all, uh, what do they call it when you die and you see God? Out of, out of body experiences, experiences. or yep. near death, yeah, or near death experiences, all of them occur during KP zero. They also found that remote viewing psychic abilities increase during these KP zero times. And the, and the magnetic uh, excursion and the waning magnetosphere means we are going to be telepathic going into these times. And there's going to be lots of psychic abilities. And now the, and also there's also human health effects that are to the negative. <clears throat> a lot of people think that uh, there's a direct correlation to the telluric currents, the earth currents. So the magnetosphere, the, the energy comes into our planet at the poles, which we circularly call the aurora, and they emanate out at the mm -hmm. uh, equator. That's our magnetic field. But what it does is it charges the surface of the earth through telluric currents. So just like Tesla posited, the earth contains huge amount of electric flow. And now this electric flow is what mm -hmm. is, uh, causes earthquakes and volcanic activity. And, and so we know this scientifically, but what we're speculating medically is that these elect currents cause affibrillation and, and heart attack and stroke. And there's a direct correlation between uptick and heart attacks mm -hmm. and stroke at KP zero, as well as high KP and at high KP and at KP zero, the same thing is happening. You have extra current flowing through the planet. And, and many people in the medical field are speculating that high tension power lines pick up this current and emulate it out as low frequent, uh, low frequency radiation, LFR, which we know affects bee populations, humans, and all biological life. So we're entering a time where certain biological humans and other entities cannot handle these effects. Where at the, whereas the same time, certain biological entities uh, flourish in these same environments. And it all has to do with the DNA you were given, unfortunately. Exactly. <laughs> very well said. Yeah, very. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, yeah, it's very interesting times we're living in and how it's, uh, you know, even um, I know you were speaking on earlier on near how the when we had one of the shortest growing seasons this year. Um, you know, from, from, cause we had such a late, uh, uh, fall or late or early fall freeze, um, there. And I think it was like June or something. You guys had a frost and same with, we, we had a frost up here in Manitoba as well. And, um, that's something else that's affected too, as, um, you know, we've noticed, um, as we're going into this, the, the weather cycles and patterns are all messy and changing too, as well. Eh? Yeah, well, if you don't know how to farm in these conditions, and no one does, uh, a lot of people that are new to farming just don't know what's happening. You'll plant these crops. They get stunted at that late June uh, freeze. We had a freeze June 23rd, three years now running, and it's always June 23rd. It, it was probably June 23rd up there or a day before because of the weather pattern. But, um, but uh, once your crops are stunted – they don't produce and people leave them in the ground saying, Oh, they'll be fine in July. They just don't do anything. And you're better off simply the next day planting new seed and actually getting a yield. So what we've done all the time is that at the beginning of June in our greenhouses, we plant all the crops that are out because we know they may freeze. And when they freeze the next day, we'll come out and we'll replant all the starts, which are actual full plants in the same spot. And so that's how we still get some yield off of it. And we did pretty good this year. It was less than 75 days of growing season. And we still got, you know, 50 pounds of summer squash and 25 pounds of winter squash, hundreds of pounds of potatoes and other tubers. And, and the beauty is that you can always switch your crops over to more nutrient dense greens in the brassica family. I mean, yeah. there are so many heirloom brassicas coming out of China through Baker Creek heirlooms where we can grow some stuff that was growing back during the Maunder minimum. Now uh, bok choy varieties, things that grow in low light, arugulas that are 10 times more nutrient dense than anything else we need. And if we need to feed 
need large populations, we can do it on small acreages. So this is the way we got to start shifting our thinking. Definitely. I think that's such an important point you brought up and especially, you know, finding ways to to continue the growing season into the winter as well. Um, you've undertaken um, an experimental project with a, a, a geothermal greenhouse and thermal mass with a small unit. And then now you've moved into this, this really nice one that you've worked really hard on uh, that I've been watching the progress on. Um, can you speak to us on the, the geothermal greenhouses and thermal mass and why that's so important um, in these growing seasons to be able to grow in the winter? Well, I think it's important, first of all, for everyone to be utilizing rigid greenhouses, uh, not plastics. Because if we can't get these plastics anymore because there's no more shipping or whatever, then in a few years, your plastics are, are moot. You can't save them. They have a very short life. Rigid greenhouses and now some of the glazings that I'm using, have, I have a, there's a Solx greenhouse up the road here that's been tested for 15 years and it's still uh, fine. Wow. We get, we're going to have, yeah, incre increased hail uh, over the next decade or so. And, and we've already seen hail five and six inches in the U S and this is just going to increase everywhere in the spring. So in the springtime, when you're trying to grow all your food, let's say five inch hail destroys your greenhouse. All your starts are dead. You're dead. If, if you really need that food. So I think that rigid greenhouses are the way for everyone to grow to protect them from weather. Also winds will be increasing. And more importantly, if you have a rigid greenhouse and you incorporate the geothermal energy, you can literally grow anything at any time of year. And we experimenting for five and a half years on all of the types of thermal mass, climate batteries and geothermal techniques that have been used since the seventies in greenhouses. And we determine that most of them are garbage. They, they sell lots of YouTube videos and books and shit but they just don't grow food in extreme environments. And, and, and that when you get down to the science of it all, all you need is water. And you could prove this to yourself by interviewing anyone that is uh, using uh, these advanced techniques where they're actually growing fish in greenhouses in environments that get below freezing. So if you look at commercial hydroponics greenhouses, because they incorporate so much water, all they need is a little piece of plastic over a hoop house and they maintain constant heat. It's in the thermal mass of the water. So the first thing you need in your rigid greenhouse is lots of water. If you could bring 5,000 gallons into a 2,500 square foot space, you can keep the temperature above freezing no matter where you are on the planet. So that's your first step. On top of that, it also regulates the temperature fluctuations and keeps it more level, which plants like. The second thing you can do is use earth tube technology, which is not the climate battery nonsense that people talk about. The climate battery uses too many tubes, too many resources, and produces not enough thermal mass. If you want to heat the soil beneath your greenhouse, all you need is a close Oh, did we lose you? Oh, I think we might have lost him for a second. We'll just give it a second here, everybody. It goes and, out. Uh, he's got satellite, so yeah. So it goes out. It goes out into the property for a minimum of 120 meters. That's about 350 feet. So you need to go out 300 feet and back in 300 feet, which is a huge circle, and you need to do that below six feet. Now, what we did in our, our build for this new greenhouse that you're watching is we put tubes out at six feet and then drop them down to 12 feet and back in. So we're harnessing pure earth energy at the deepest depth, and we're going to get a constant flow of 54 degree air anytime we want it. So this will allow us with the thermal mass in the water and the earth tubes to literally heat the greenhouse and keep it at a minimum temperature of 54, which is like zone 32. That's literally Laos or anywhere on the equator where the temperature doesn't drop below 54 degrees is almost nowhere on the planet. So you can do this by simply digging a trench. And this is one of the most underutilized 
uh, engineering feats on the planet. And I guarantee that prior to the Younger Dryas event, before 12,900 years ago, there were civilizations using this. I know there were. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. So important. <laughs> I love I love that information because uh, it's it looks so um, awesome for you know continuing on. And I mean, I look forward to seeing you grow some uh, orange trees or a uh, lemon tree in there. <laughs> yeah, because that's that's yeah, the next indeed. step, right? Um, yeah, it's just yeah, amazing. Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah we're, we're looking saying. to grow food in there in in May in maybe three to four weeks. So we we just started finishing off and closing it up and about three or four weeks because we need to be ready in early February as the sun's uh, the daylight cycle starts increasing to mimic a tropical forest. We got to get the seeds in now. We got to get the starts in, in February and we should be rocking by like March. We should be having abundance of food in there. Totally. And then it's the experiment of, of the multi-year experiment. Will the key limes grow? Will the citrus grow? Can we do passion fruit? Can we do uh, exotic prawns and hydroponics in there? I mean, this is literally the, the water you're using to water your system and you're using a, maybe a solar pump. You could be growing like three pound prawns in the water system and using their poop and, and the products that come from that to, to be nutrients in your plants. It, it's a never ending. And in fact, it's, it's mind boggling how pathetic our growing systems are right now and why we haven't adapted uh, in, in more resilient ways. It all has to do with the deep state, uh, the control mechanism, the CIA, the fact that we go to war and we had to use all these war chemicals. That's modern agriculture. It's a waste dump for war chemicals. <laughs> well I mean, said. it's disgusting. Well said. That's exactly what it is. The, the chemicals that are in this food that we have is just, it's, un, it's unimaginable. It's part of the reason why I started looking for more healthier food options and stuff and putting on that path. Um, and you know, just trying to find healthier food options because the, the food out there is horrible and it's, it's latent with chemicals and processed foods. And, uh, I mean, even, you know, obviously being vegan, there's processed foods, but we don't generally try to eat more beans and legumes and rices and stuff like that. And, um, but yeah, it's amazing when you actually start learning about uh, what's in your food and how detrimental it is to your health and your children's health. Um, so, so important to, to be able to grow your own food and year round too, as food prices we've noticed are, are starting to skyrocket and get a lot more expensive. Um, like, you know, your average, everything's going up, you know, especially with this current <laughs> pandemic that's going on. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, right? Um, yeah. Well, and this, we, is, this is the tip. This is the tip of the iceberg as far as inflation. Unfortunately, by midsummer of next year, uh, not only the amount of evictions and homeless people will be increasing, but the amount of people that are malnourished and starving. In the city I live in, when I moved here five and a half years ago, I found out some of the most disgusting statistics. 64% of the population in my tiny town, it's one of the smallest mountain towns here, uh, was below the poverty level and they couldn't even feed themselves the proper amount of nutrition. 64% of my town. And we now have one of the biggest geothermal greenhouse projects utilizing the, the deepest hot spring in the, in, in the United States here in Pagosa Springs to grow food and to, to teach the community that they can be self-reliant and self-resilient. Now, the problem is that uh, the human race has been uh, programmed for generations to become lazy, compliant pricks. And, and the majority of people, like I, I have sat down with a number of people that are looking for our opportunities on how to be successful in their own private business. And I have thousands of ideas that are completely operational and will make you a success. And, and when I lay out what people need to do, they tell me that they're like, they're astounded. They're like, that's so much work. Uh, you know, and they, and they don't follow through. And yeah. it, it, it boggles my mind how people don't realize that hard work is how you get successful and how you can then become self-reliant. Like people are like, how are you doing all this in the middle of nowhere? And be like, well, I have like hundreds of side things going on. I I'm up 16 hours a day working my ass off. What are you doing? They're literally sitting there watching YouTube and thinking that somehow money's <laughs> going to fall out of the sky. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't work that way. No. 
You, no. can, you can work hard and grow money. You can work hard and raise honey, which is money. That all takes time. You can, uh, I mean, even if you don't own a house or land, there are hundreds of people that own homesteads. Just go on the wolf program that will pay you to come there and, and, and uh, take care of their farm. You'll live there for free. You'll learn everything you know how to live yourself independently. And you might also gain tricks on how to make money doing the stuff you want to do, like grow food. I want to grow my own food, exotic stuff, uh, find stuff that grows in regions that they can't grow here before, blow people's minds, and then make money off of it. That's what I want to do. Yeah, and that's the best way because you're doing something yeah. you love to do too at the same time, right? Like um, growing food and gardening and being outdoors in general like uh, is is so amazing. I mean, you also talk about Shin, Shinrin Yoku, uh, forest bathing, which I think is such yeah. an interesting um, technique and is it's so calming too at the same time. I don't have as many forests. I live on a flat prairie, but I mean, when I do get to experience a, a forest setting, you know, being able to just soak it in and try to actually uh, um, take what I've learned with that Shinrin Yoku is really a amazing thing. And I think that's so amazing that uh, you speak on that as well. Um, you know, meditation is so important in a time of craziness. Yeah, well, the Shinrin Yoku is if you're if you're struggling meditating. Look, there's a whole uh, philosophy and science that for the last fifty years has been uncovered. There are now peer reviewed papers on why. So a lot of people know that going in the forest makes them feel good. They know it. They're like, I grew up in the forest. I loved it. The memories I have. The reason those memories are stored is because the forest is emanating pheromones, so to speak, like humans. These are actually. Um, you know, the same terpenes that are in cannabis, uh, trees make terpenes. And these terpenes are em emanated by the trees as antibiotics that you breathe in that make you well. And people are just starting to understand this. So it's important that you walk in the right type of forests or any forests. Pine forests give different terpenes than oak forests, give different terpenes than desert forests. But the terpenes are all there. And these are literally antibiotic, antiviral, and even uh, they're calming. So they have something to do with mental health as well. And all you have to do is be present and not be uh, duped by the fake world that you lived in. And, and what I mean by that is go in there with an open mind and heart and just be present and, and, and experience. It's one of the simplest things you can do and the most rewarding to your, uh, to your soul and to your biome. Totally. Well said. Yeah, it's so such an important uh, technique. And um, yeah, I, I've, I wouldn't have known about it if it wasn't for your channel. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing uh, experience to, to actually more or less just turn off and enjoy it for a second. And um, yeah, it's cool. Um, you know, you, you mentioned like hard work and like uh, you also mentioned in your, your bio there, it talks about you are a dry set mason. So you've done some masonry and stuff and that's hard work. And uh, as a bricklayer myself, that's what I do for my job. And I, and I, so I can totally relate to you what hard work means and why it's important and being able to put the time in. Um, that's how you get the best reward out of it. Um, you know, but, you know, on that, you know, that's kind of led you towards like a lot of ancient uh, petroglyphs and ruins in your history as a geologist you do some amazing exploration uh, throughout your area and stuff. Um, and, and, you know, you, you're able to see the, the petroglyphs and the ruins and the, the designs that they've, the, they've left on the, on the stone and stuff. It's some amazing stuff you, uh, you explore and see. Can you just speak on that a little bit? Well, I, what I know is that, uh, the history we've been taught is a lie. And, and you could prove this to yourself. Most of the information prior to 1900 is made up. And, and, and all, less than 10% prior to 1900 is even true. So when you get the narratives on you know, the pyramids that they were built with copper tools and millions of people moved these blocks around, you, uh, you can immediately call out the lie. And the fact that uh, what, what they claim is that we have hunter gatherers out here and that they're just milling around and not doing much. When you go out to the sites where we are in the four corners, you can see that there were millions of people in every direction. You, you can drive anywhere for a hundred miles and find the same amount of communities built into the cliff sides everywhere. On top of the mesas, there were pueblos that housed thousands of people on every mesa. And just in the Cedar Mesa area of Utah, there are 800 mesas. 
And if you put a thousand people on 800 mesas, you have a million people just in a small area of Utah. So the stories they're telling us are complete fabrications, first of all. Second, when you go out to these places, they were all abandoned for some reason. And the narrative about that has been lost. When you make friends with the natives, the natives themselves don't really know what, what's going on. So just like the reparations, just like burning books and the burning of uh, all of the libraries, the library in Alexandria, the same events happened here in the Americas. The reason we go out here is to, to try to document not only the extent of the population, of the amount of people that we murdered to take over this land, but also to show that the, the storyline about what's going on is a little incorrect. And, and, uh, and let's go talk about the petroglyphs. So first of all, that's the people. The people living out here in the Southwest have very little to do with the history of the petroglyphs, except that they've passed this knowledge on. And then modern society just erased it. And what I'm talking about is 30% of all the petroglyphs worldwide are the same. And this is a group of petroglyphs called the unknowns. And as early as the 90s, archaeologists consider this a phenomenon. Just like the, the ancient pyramid, if, if you measure the, the height of it, it's the same as the, the height of the earth. If you measure the circumference and multiply by 43,000, it's the same as the circumference of the earth. And those archaeologists or Egyptologists, so-called, say that, oh, it's a coincidence. <laughs> the petroglyphs that are all the same worldwide are also a coincidence. But thankfully, a, a plasma physicist by the name of Anthony Peratt in the 80s happened to wander into one of these petroglyph con conferences or, 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 or take heed of it. And he's looking at these petroglyphs and he knew what they were. These were plasma discharges uh, features that he was making in his lab in Los Alamos. And, and, and a few discussions with an author named Dave Talbot and who's now uh, a major player in the electric universe and the Thunderbolts project, what they uncovered was that all of these ancient cultures were witnessing something in the night sky that had to do with our magnetosphere and that Aurora and that stuff we talked about in the beginning that they all witnessed at the same time. And they were all drawing it on the rocks. And these images were emanating out of the North pole, the same place that we would see the Aurora today. Yet, if you were in, let's say, New Mexico, where you can't see the aurora today, back then, they could see these images. And they were so profound and so life-changing that they had to put them down on rock. The same images that are in Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico are the same images that are in the middle of the Atlantic, in Sardinia, all through Europe, all through the Baltics, all through Asia, in all the ancient sites. This same squatter man, the same Jacob's ladder, the same patterns that can be created in a plasma physics lab by a plasma physicist can be seen on these rocks. Now, the only way that could happen on our planet is if the magnetosphere goes down or the sun has a major outburst, like Robert Schock thinks happened at the end of the Younger Dryas and actually created the first alphabet which we find on Easter Island called the Rongo Rongo. If you look at the Rongo Rongo tablets, they are all the missing petroglyphs worldwide that no one can explain. And yet the Easter Island people, according to archaeology a few hundred years ago, made up an alphabet consisting of all of the ancient petroglyphs that no one can explain. It, it, ancient history is such a sham. It's almost uh, comical. Oh wow! I don't think you've ever spoke on that last part there. The 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 Rama tablets or which ones were there? I don't think I've heard about those ones yet. The Rongo Rongo. I've been doing a lot Rongo, of research Rongo. on Easter Island studies. Yeah, and Thor Heyerdahl was the first person to gain access to some of these secret caves, and actually uh, was the first person to document the Rongo Rongo tablets. And then Dr. Shock, a geologist, the one that pushed the date of the Sphinx back 8,500 years um, and got completely exiled from mainstream science, he uh, led me to do more research. And, and when you simply look at the depositional deposits, these, uh, these Moai heads that stick out of the ground in Easter Island literally go another 65 feet deeper. 
If you look at the depositional patterns on Easter Island today, that would take 15,000 years to bury those statues. And they're claiming that those statues were carved 800 years ago. It's completely ludicrous. <laughs> wow. Hey, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. I don't think I, yeah, that's, that's really awesome knowledge. I like that. I'm going to have to look into that a little bit. Um, my, my wife's from Chile. So yeah, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. I like that. That's just well, I would, I would look for the book. Here's an excellent book. It's called Aku Aku. It's by Thor Heyerdahl. I just got an original signed first edition copy, uh, from an auction house and I've been loving that book so oh awesome yeah that's cool i'll have to look into that and yeah that's really cool um yeah that's that's really um uh so like we, 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 we uh we're coming up to the like a um december 21st we're going into like a, an injunction kind of thing where the planets haven't been aligned in a long time um that's uh i know some people speak on how it might have a pull on our uh, earth and stuff coming up um you know what's yeah. What's your take on that a little bit? Well, you're talking about the great conjunction. Yes. The great conjunction on it happens to fall on the winter solstice, December 21st, 2020. But when actually the, they will, the planets of Jupiter and Saturn will be closer uh, starting December 16th than they have ever been since 1266, which, by the way, is the beginning of a hellish uh 600 years on planet earth 1266 is probably one of the most unknown years and all the years following that up into the 1600s very limited information it was the time of dragons and and other elves and fairies and so very little is known about that now the there's a recent, a more recent conjunction in the 1600s that was a little further apart and, and th so those two events are the most recent events comparable to the one coming up. Now there's a few things that happen during these great conjunctions. You can read about the uh, curse of the presidents. Have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay. So every president that has ever been inaugurated during a, the year of a grand conjunction dies in office. There's the first one. And there has been uh, quite a few, I think oh. eight or nine, because the Grand Conjunction happens every 19.85 years. Not this severe and not this aligned. The, yeah. the closest this alignment is, you have to go back to 1266. But every 19.85 years, there's a Grand Conjunction. And in fact, uh, Kepler's Trigon is a very famous picture. So if you want to just search... Kepler's trigon, it, the, the grand conjunctions every 18.6 years make a triangle in the night sky that slowly rotate around. This Kepler's trigon is one of the most famous pieces of ancient art. And, and back then, people were corresponding these events to major changes in society. And so there is truth to the grand conjunction changing things. And it has been documented for time and memorial and we are entering one of the biggest grand conjunctions since 1266 now a couple of things that i could speak on as a scientist <clears throat> what we should see and we are at a, a large earthquake deficit for the year so what's going to happen between now and christmas or in that time frame is a large earthquake over seven magnitude now these typically happen in mostly uninhabited areas but could this be the large earthquake at the New Madrid? Could it be on the West Coast in California? Could it be Cascadia? Be a great time for that to happen. These alignments do trigger earthquakes, especially if they're coupled with some type of space weather. Another thing is uh, the Tecumseh curse, another grand conjunction. And, and there are numerous, you'd have to delve into it because if you go onto these search engines, this information is being taken down. They don't want you to connect the dots. So you need to really do some deep homework to find out what's going on. But these grand conjunctions always coincide with massive shifts. And, and we're entering the age of Aquarius. So you can bring in the yugic science, the science of the yuga and the great year. Is this the shift into the Kali Yuga? It, it, it certainly is it the shift into the age of Aquarius. If you go on YouTube, you're going to get people to say, now we're in Pisces and yes, we're in Aquarius. It doesn't matter. The planets are aligning, I'll assure you, because if you go out there, they will touch 
and they will become the Bethlehem star on the 21st, regardless yeah. of if you believe it or not. Right. So it's, de it's definitely happening. Not only that, the great reset is happening. The biggest conspiracy in history that it was never happening is happening before your very lives. Canada is complicit. The Biden administration is complicit all through Europe. This could be the beginning of the worst shit show in humanity's existence, which will end, believe, believe me, in major civil unrest <laughs> if the sun doesn't start that prior. Yeah, exactly. We can only hope for that. <laughs> you know, uh, nice yeah. to meet. Yeah, exactly. Knock, knock things back into the Stone Age. <laughs> Trust me, I, we could use some technical yeah, if you, technology. <clears throat> if we were just to all stop staring into our squares, uh, all the brainwashing would end. The problem is that people don't have the ability to turn the square off anymore. It literally is connected to their consciousness. They become depressed, alone, detached, and all this crap, which is why we need to get uh, reattached to, to Gaia, to Earth, to our source. The, the powers that be want to detach us from source. And, and it's my firm belief that we all need to have our own great reset. Yeah, totally. And that's, and then we've seen with what's gone on over the last nine to 10 months that um, this was almost the best way to put people in this fear and panic stage and really start to control them with, you know, with the box that they're stuck watching. Um, you know, on, on that, um, you know, where, where do you see things going in the next, uh, within the, you know, next couple of weeks within, you know, the current events and stuff uh, that we see, I mean, we see pretty wow. wild things happening down there and we see wild things happening in Canada. We just recently found out we have possibly Can uh, Chinese troops training in different locations in Canada, uh, sanctioned by Mr. You know, our prime minister there. Um, and, and you know, like we don't know even up here where we're going and it's, it's a, it's a very interesting time we're living in. And, um, you know, the next, uh, I think the next month or two is going to be very, very interesting. And like you said, it is a great reset and some reset of some sort. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything to throw in on the next little while with what's going to be happening? We see, I know you had some interesting videos here recently about the shot into the arm that's been going around, but we won't go too far on that. But I mean, the current current event cycle is very uh, troubling in certain ways, especially you know if you have family and young kids and stuff, and you know like uh, yeah, where do you where do you think see things going for after Christmas into twenty twenty one? Well, I think the big date is the inauguration, um, and and anything can happen up until then. If you're listening to the inside chatter, like my partner and I do every day, and we're inundated with insider information and hundreds of emails. Uh, we have to wade through it if we actually want to get to the facts. Um, there could be a number of reasons why the current sitting president was on the ship with uh, military intelligence and, and not doing his normal duties. He could be uh, looking to pull something out of th his hat because what's been uncovered and the mainstream refuses to report on it in the U.S. is there has been epic amounts of voter fraud. I just posted some uh, definitely uh, – illegal videos on the main platforms up on my new library account and bit shoot. And this is the beginning of testimony on the voter fraud in Nevada. Tomorrow, a very famous Canadian, Stephen Crowder is about to go out to some of these. Um, and he's literally anyway, but we'll talk about Stephen later, but Crowder is about to go out to some of these addresses that are literally non-existent. And what they found was epic amounts of voter fraud in Florida, dead people voting, people voting twice. Um, people voting that don't even exist and on and on. Yet the mainstream media has been repeating the same uh, rabbit wheel. There's no voter fraud. Where's the voter fraud? So if you can uncover this massive voter fraud in a tiny state like Nevada, can you imagine? And the fact that Dominion voting systems are owned by, by China and Spartmatic software is owned by China and everything that has to do with the American election goes back to China. And then you start to investigate the Democratic Party. Hunter Biden's ties to China. Joe Biden's ties to China. Swal What's his name? Swaywell and Fang Fang's ties to China. Chinese spies. And a friend of mine has uncovered 86 people in the Democratic Party all have pictures with top Chinese officials. What the fuck is going on? That's what you got to start to wonder. Yeah. What is going on? Ch I mean, and so 
a lot's going on. The grand, the great conjunction and, and Christmas. I don't even know how to pack my stuffing prop, uh, stocking properly. <laughs> Isn't that just the truth? You don't know what to put in it. <laughs> oh, I hear you Bullet on that one. <laughs> Bullets, butter, and handguns. I mean, like, I don't know what goes in there. What Maybe do you a mean? vest or two, too, you know, the way the stabbings have been going. I mean, it seems to be the weapon That's... of choice in some of these protests. I've been watching with uh, Elijah Schaefer and stuff, and it's it's just it's sad to see that that's how low these people are going with the firework bombs and the stabbings and, you know, like, and then, yeah, it's just, it's tough. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> My part, my partner and I were discussing recently. What's the only thing that? What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? And we all thought about it. And the only thing we decided that is important is body armor. Isn't that sad? <laughs> it is sad. I know. Isn't and that, that sad that that's what and we're and here's even more sad that we can't buy the body armor online because they'll know it's us. We have to get it at a gun show anonymously. And, yeah, and, and, and so that, that this is the world we live in. I have to go buy body armor to feel safe anonymously at a gun show because the control mechanism is so deep. They know everything you're doing. I mean, they're, they're literally watching the show to gain information right now. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, going on to that, you have, uh, you started a couple different platforms to be able to share some uncentered content. Um, which I think has really been uh, amazing to be able to get your voice out there and actually speak on things you want to say, um, which is which is great. So I really like your library account, and you know I encourage everyone to check out um, Diamonds all his accounts. But if you want the uncensored stuff, uh, definitely check out the library page, and uh, it's it's really good. And yeah, that was something you spoke on too, Stephen Crowder's little road trip. I've been wondering what's happening with this show. I actually forgot about his road trip that he's actually going on to investigate these uh, these 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 addresses and locations. And uh, tomorrow it will be a very interesting show, and I think that's going to be very fun to watch and, and just see the the straight debunking right, right there live. Um, he's done such an amazing job with, uh, you know, sharing a, a different side again. And you know that's kind of why I started this this, yeah. this podcast and this this talking right to give another perspective. Um, you can probably imagine most vegans are on the far left, <laughs> and, and and you know pushing the global warming and the weird agendas that just don't make any sense. Um, yeah, and you know I've always been a critical thinker and to think for myself. And um, you know I think it's so important to do your own research and you know find other sources that aren't <laughs> the standard sources. Um, so yeah, on, on closing, do you have anything else you'd like to, you know, share with everybody on, um, uh, where to find you and what your, yeah. what your plans are for 2021? Yeah. Well, first I want to say to everyone listening, there's hope. There is hope uh, because I come from social, I'm a social justice warrior. I mean, I work in the industry for half a decade as canvas director, raising millions of dollars for all types of progressive groups, including the ACLU, nature.com. I mean, I fight gold. I, I fought gold mines in Alaska, all types of stuff. You don't have to believe in saving the planet and ending pollution and be a Democrat. Trust me, you don't have to because I'm not, I used to vote Democrat, but once I got enough information, I realized that there's something extremely wrong with that platform. They are not for the humans. They are not for the patriots. They are not for your sovereignty. They don't care about you, your decisions, your freedoms, your right to grow food. The Democrats are the number ones pushing GMOs and polluting you. They're the number one group keeping inner cities poor and complicit so that they have voters. And, and it's time that the world wakes up to the scam. And, and, and you're in a very critical time. In the next few months, a lot of things could hit the fan. And they want to catch you off guard so you remain complicit, you follow their orders, and you get whisked into whatever smart city or whatever plan that they have for you. Very few people are in a position like I am in the middle of nowhere where we can literally cut our road off and all 800 people down here are going to be fine. And we don't care if another person comes down here, but most people aren't like that. So my warning is get a bug out plan, start finding like-minded groups or places you can go because you'll be welcome when the help is needed and learn how to work hard and work to live and love what you do. The moment you change your life to do something you love, 
no matter how bad it gets, you still love what you're doing. I mean, it sucks to shovel shit or do all kind of the stuff I do, but I am never without happiness at any moment of the day. And, and that's just fact. Uh, well said. Well said. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, like I said, uh, I thank you for all your information and all the work you put into your YouTube channel and uh, your two channels, I should say, as um, your first channel has been demonetized and censored pretty heavily. And <laughs> exactly. And, and I've experienced that as well, just with doing some standard reporting with my 170 subscribers. I had my, my one uh, video doing, uh, I was going into hospital, some of the hospitals in the local community here that they were saying were overrun and they were triaging in the parking lots. And, you know, we're, we're, we're killing people because we're having a freedom rally uh, a kilometer away. And, you know, we, 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 we walk in there and we're just see, well, it's empty, <laughs> you know, like uh, where's all the people? Oh, well, there's just, there's one person ahead of you. It'll be, you know, about 45 minutes. So, um, yeah, I can, I totally know that censorship that, that we face on the channel and, and the way, you know, with the information you've shared has been so, so amazing. And it's helped me uh, grow to be a better, better person in a sense. And uh, it's been amazing. So, you know, I appreciate all the work you and uh, Leah have put into your, your information sharing and your channels. And uh, I look forward to all your new videos. And um, I would love to have another conversation with you in January or February or something. Um, and yeah, if, if that, if you'd be, if you'd be okay with that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I appreciate what you do. Alternative media is the future, the only future of true news and true information because as of uh, 2012 in America, the Smith Modernization Act was passed and, and that allows all mainstream media to produce nothing but propaganda. You don't have to have facts. That was proven by Tucker Carlson, who was sued and recently was in a court case. And he said, look, I'm an editorial uh, newscaster. Nothing I say is necessarily true. It's all opinion. And that's how he won. They don't have to tell you the facts. They never did. And with this Smith Munt, a modernization act passed they never will yeah i think that's a, that's a very good point um you know that's where i learned from that was you and uh, uh dr paul cottrell uh and when you guys first dived, dived into that uh it was amazing information and that really opened up the eyes to the mainstream media for me so it's uh it's what everybody needs to know and the cool. media is out there to lie to us and you know, they're not out there for our uh you know to help us in any sort of way <laughs> so um yeah, yeah so check that. us out we Check out our YouTube channels, Oppenheimer Ranch, Demonetized, Magnetic Reversal News is the monetized channel where most of our content is. Shinrin Yoku is our third channel. If you want to learn about Shinrin Yoku, it's all on there in real short five-minute digestible videos. And our alternative sites are Library, which is Oppenheimer Ranch Project on Library and Oppenheimer Ranch Project on BitChute. And if you find any of our videos on YouTube, all the links are below. So just go below any video and you can find links to everywhere. Yeah. And you also do a wonderful job of always sharing the links to all your news sources so that people can actually go and do the research themselves, which you always um, encourage people to do. And I think that's such an uh, important part, right? To never just uh, take people's word for it. Go, go and look at the links and do the research. And, you know, I think that's, that's so important to be able to share that. I know a lot of people don't always... Uh, you know, put that extra time in to put those links in. So, you know, thanks again for all that hard work you do. And, uh, <laughs> and also you have a Patreon as yeah. well, right? You have Patreon as well. If people want to support you. Um, I know I'm, I've been a patron for a while of yours and, uh, you know, it's, you know, you, you do a lot of hard work in uh, video editing and putting the, the videos out. It takes time. So, you know, thanks again for everything you do. So, um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. And, uh, we'll, we'll we, go to, we, we'll go to the next one. Awesome. On the next one. Cool. Perfect. Awesome. Can't Thanks wait. again. Can I can Thanks I ask really me. quick, Diamond? Will you stick around Boom. backstage just just for a few minutes after the show ends? Okay. Did you hear? Uh, did you hear, Andy? Are you able to stick around at the end of the show just for a few minutes uh, in backstage? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got right. five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. For sure. Yeah. So yeah, with that, everybody, um, you know, thanks for joining the sh uh, show with us today. It was an amazing uh, talk with uh, uh, Diamond from Oppenheimer Ranch, Pro Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News. Um, go follow him on his channels. Um, you know, like and subscribe. Show him some support. Uh, he's got great information. And with that, everybody, um, thanks for watching Winnipeg Alternative Media tonight. 
go to our uh, website, check out our links, um, donate if you can. And everybody, enjoy, uh, enjoy your week. And uh, we'll see you uh, next week uh, before Christmas. And have a, have a good week, everybody. It's Right Side Vegan News.